All right, if you have your Bible then at Matthew chapter 5, we'll begin reading in the first verse, Matthew 5 in the first verse. The Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when they shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for an evening to be in your house and to meet your people here. God, we pray tonight that we would see in this uh, new things, Lord, that it would mean uh, more treasured things to our heart, the promises that you've given us if we, uh, if we are able to have the fruit that is also within it. God, help us together as a people, uh, shore us up in these last days, make us prepared and ready to meet you. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, which in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some very familiar verses of Scripture. As a child, I learned them as the Beatitudes. Uh, and, uh, of course, be meaning a helping verb. That's how you should be. And then all these attributes. But I think the part that I've never heard preached in my whole life is the reward that you get for doing what the Bible says. Now, uh, to me, that's as much of a treasure as, as the work that there is to get there. In other words, these blessings that he puts at the end of each of these statements, they don't come unless you have that attribute or that trait. Now, listen, you know, we can uh, pretend to be something we're not. I can pretend that I don't need glasses because I don't like the way they make me look, but I'll get about two feet from you and I'll trip over the pew. Because you know what? The fact is, is I desperately need these little things. And pretending to be something or to have something you don't is no good. Right. And for example, if you try to be humble and you're not, you've not gained a thing. You, and, and see, the Lord God knows this better than we know ourselves. So if you don't have these, he certainly well knows that you do not possess them genuinely. So in the first verse, the Bible says, and seeing the multitudes. Now this is the Lord's uh, first portion of the so-called Sermon on the Mount. I think it's interesting that it says the multitudes were there, and then he climbed the mountain, and then it said his disciples were with him. So I question whether the whole multitudes were dedicated enough to climb the mountain, or when did he got to the top, did he just have the cream of the crop? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if those that were just following and with some interest would have enough, enough about them to climb a mountain. You know why sometimes services are difficult? Uh, maybe they're dry, maybe they're dreary. Well, maybe it's because we've not climbed to the mountain. Maybe you haven't done your portion of the prayer. You know, prayer is work. After 32 years of sincere service to the yeah. Lord, I have found that prayer is work. It don't just happen with snap. You know, that's, that's the problem with the Catholic teaching of having these little memory prayers. There's no heartfelt love in it. There, there's, no, there, there's no begging before the true God of heaven. You know, I can say, now I lay me down to sleep, but does that really get a hold of God? I really don't think it does. And, and so we find then maybe the only ones that made it to the top and heard this glorious sermon on the mount was his disciples. In other words, it's a good measure for you to, and I, don't, I didn't say apostles, I said disciples. And right. maybe the only ones that, that really made it to the top were the ones
ones dedicated enough to climb the mountain. Yeah. So that's just some some thought for you as the week goes by. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set already, uh, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them taught those individuals, the ones that were willing to come up to climb the mountain, he taught them that, uh, that were present after the mountain climb. And then he begins, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I want you to see it says poor in spirit. It doesn't say poor. Now, uh, many of the people of the Lord are poor, and that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being poor, but there's no reward in it either. Uh, but the Lord did say this in his own personal min ministry, hardly shall I, a man who is rich shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And uh, the reason why you begin to trust that money more than you trust the Lord. And, and, you know, when they take currency away from us and control our own banking, then we'll learn what's really precious. Right. And, and, and so we find uh, that this individual is poor in spirit. Now, have you ever met anybody like that? Uh, have you ever met anybody that uh, was uh, not self-assuming? Let me read you something. Just put your finger there, and we'll come back to it. I don't know that I'll get to all these verses, but I do want to show you something. Um, Isaiah 66. And we'll just read one verse for time's sake. Isaiah 66, in verse 2, the Bible says this, For all those things have my have mine hand made, and all those things have been saith the Lord, but to me, when I look even upon him that is, uh, is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. So this is the poor individual that the Lord God Almighty is looking for, one that lacks pride. Now, it is very easy to get prideful in the flesh. You can get prideful because you're a good nurse. You can get prideful because you're a decent preacher. You can get uh, uh, prideful over your home. Lots of things that you can build pride out of. But I want you to see, he says, these meek, humble people, they're the poor ones. They're the ones I'm interested in. And you know what? Uh, I, I, I look at an individual person regarding the ministry before I listen to how he preaches. Now, everybody has their own preaching style. Everybody has their own way. Hey, I think that's why he calls different people, don't you? Because we're each unique and a little different. But, uh, and not to boast on Jared, but he, he's probably the most contract person I've ever met that's in the ministry anyway. And that's what God's looking for. He's not looking for a boaster. He, he's, not, he's not looking for another Billy Graham. He's looking for people of a contrite, obedient spirit. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, in attitude, in demeanor. And then the blessing is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I want you to see that it's an already said and done thing. The people that have that attribute have this reward. And even, uh, so the poor and contrite spirit, the humble individual already has a home in the kingdom of God. What could be richer, what could be fuller than that, that blessed promise to these individuals specifically. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed be that mourn. Now, uh, I guess the, the thing about mourning is what are you mourning about? What, 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 is, what it is that you lost? I remember uh, right before I started the EMT school in uh, 87, I bought my first car that I bought myself, and it was a little Ford Festiva. They only put, they only, in, I was going to say put them out. They only imported them for two years. And uh, I love that car. It's my first stick, and uh, I mean, it, it was nice, and uh, I, I just loved it. And so uh, me and this girl I went to school with named Debbie Gibson were going to the store in that little Festiva, 
and we were going up the hill by the old W.T. Thomas School, and a, a girl in a big Lincoln Continental came by and just T-boned us. That was the end of my Ford Festiva. And uh, you know what? I mourned over it. I'm like, I'm never going to have a car I like so much ever again. And uh, you know, that's not what he's looking for. To mourn something, it has to be lost, right? Either, either someone has to die, or, or you have to lose a treasure that you place value on. Right, right. So uh, what is this that the individual uh, has lost? I'm not sure. Now, I often think about Mary and Lazarus and Martha. And if you remember, before the incident of Lazarus's resurrection, before any of that ever happened, he came and said, Martha, Martha. You are troubled over many things, but Mary has chosen that good part, and it will not be taken from her. So when we think about this mourning that's given to us in this verse, I guess the first question, if you really have this attribute, uh, what are you mourning for? Blessed are they that mourn. You, you know what? Whenever I really get in, in tune with my Lord God, what I really mourn for is my sin. It was taken care of on the cross of Calvary, but I've seen how it's impacted my life then, my life now, and my spiritual life with the Lord God. See, we need to get rid of some of that. Do we not? We need, we need to get in tune with the Lord so at least we, at least we would be grief-stricken over our own sin. I don't see that hardly ever in the modern-day church. Do you? And if anything, they celebrate it. Yeah. You know, uh, I was watching, I want to say this, watching a little video on Facebook of a church over in Clarksville. And they sang and carrying on and being foolish. And you know what? I was like, where did they find God in this? The music sounded like rock music to me. Where did they find God in this? Where, where is he at in that? And, and you know, the only conclusion that I could come to, they don't mourn. If something's not gone from your life, you cannot mourn it. If you've not given something up because of the cause of Christ, you haven't mourned. And, and so he says, blessed are, blessed are they that mourn, that sincerely are sorry, the sinner is sincerely regretful, sincerely sorry over sin, for they shall be comforted. That's the blessing. Yeah. You ever seen anybody that was miserable? Well, if you haven't, you will. Hey, you know, I'm talking about the Lord's own people, just, just miserable with life. And the only thing I can come to, the uh, only reason I can say there's an issue with their comfort is they're not fulfilled. They, they, you know, every one of us has lost loved ones. And, and uh, you know, they say time takes care of everything. Well, I'll have to disagree. That, that's a man-made thought. Because I know Sister Brenda, uh, uh, I bet days are just as fresh as the day it happened when Debbie died, right? I know, and, and it's been so weird, and I guess you do this in your mind, but all week I have thought about Judy, every day this week. And she's been dead almost nine years. Hard to believe, but that that's how long. You see what I'm saying? So this type of mourning is it, not, not, not that... You, you've lost a dear loved one, but you then willingly gave up something sinful in your life, and you mourn, you're truly sorry over that sin, and then the comfort will be there. Blessed are the meek. <laughs> now, they are a difficult crown to find. Uh, meek people uh, just don't... Uh, you don't see them much anymore because you know what meekness is? It's not just being, you know, love up. It's being obedient. Meekness, the, the result of meekness is obedience. 
And I've seen children six or seven years old stand up and call their dad everything in the book. There's no meekness in that. There's, and you know, you that have young children, let me tell you this. If you don't get them disciplined by the time they're four or five, you've already lost the war. That they'll be telling you instead of you telling them. And so, do you truly have this spiritual meekness? And if you do, who is that meekness directed toward? Now, our president, we have a decent president right now, and he deserves some respect. But who do you, who are we going to be meek toward? You know, the Bible uh, tells us not to be fearful of trusting in the Lord. So who are you going to be meek toward? Who, who are you going to be obedient to? And the only thing I can come to is the Lord God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be meek, and meekness is always expressed in obedience. If you want me to, Lord, I'll do it. When Isaiah, we just read this Sunday in Isaiah chapter uh, 6, when he stood and he got a hold of who the Lord wa was, and he said, who shall go? And he said, here am I, send me, send me. He was excited about the job that he had to do. He had become from prideful to meek. That's why I think that experience in the temple is very, I often wonder if it was the day Isaiah was genuinely saved. Because he started confessing to that He said, oh, I'm a man. I live in a man. I live in a world of unclean men. And I'm a man of an unclean heart. See, that salvation will grow meekness. And rebellion will grow haughtiness. And it gets down to the point, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want. That's the opposite of meekness. And so we find that. Uh, if we do possess this uh, this very uh, very rare quality, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I, I think that's a very unusual statement, and, and I, I believe that this is what the Lord God is saying. You know, there's a I, I'm still after being with the with the Sovereign Grace Baptist for 20 years. I still believe in a true 1,000 year millennial reign every second, every minute, the whole time it will be there. And you know what it says before that event happens? The earth is purged. Now, I, I personally believe when it says that will be for them, then the governors, stewards, people that know how to follow God will be in the kingdom. And, and, and so we find it's not an earthly king. Well, in the millennial reign, it'll be, it, it'll be literal, but it, it is for individuals that are like this. In other words, if you're haughty, I know everything. I've been there. I've done that. You will not be in the governmental association in the millennial reign. Verse 6. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Man, what a tall bill to fill. Just thirsting after righteousness. Uh, and you know what that really is? Uh, being right with God. If His Word says it, not only do you do it, you treasure it. You love it more than you love yourself. You see why well, that's a tall bill to fill. You know, you know what this flesh likes to do? It likes to sin. It eats it up. It's just like a, a hog on slop. And so if we want to be righteous, this flesh has to be addressed, does it not? You ever wonder why my ministry and those those of you that have been with me most of the way know that seemingly my ministry has always had a theme of getting out of this world and being separate from what's around us. Maybe, maybe the reason that is, is a righteous people get a very blessed individual blessing. And if, if, if we're willing to do that, to put self and sin aside and, and, set, and be set apart as a different people, Notice what it says. Look, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
Amen. Are you full tonight? Uh, my truck has 333,000 miles in it. Has a little clunk in it. I guess the ride's not good. You know what? I'm, I'm blessed. I have a truck. You know what? I think even if I didn't have a truck, I'd still be blessed. Because you know uh, what? What this world equates a blessing is things and money. That that's what we think blessings are, right? So I, I think we're going to have to begin to see what the Lord says, and if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, the Bible says we'll be filled. Now, if you're hungry for a chocolate bar and you go get you a nice Hershey's with almonds, after you eat it, it's satisfied. But if we get in the right, of man, uh, right frame of God and righteousness, thirst and do hunger after righteousness, when we get right with the scriptures, we'll be one more right down the road. When when you see that salvation is completely of God, you'll be one of be. And you know what? When I when I was a young Christian, first getting into churches that were sound, I knew I knew salvation was completely of grace. And then I got a little further in it, and I saw that not only was it completely of grace, it was ordained before the world began by the Almighty God. And I'm thirsting more. And then, then I come to see that every event along my life led me to a June day in 1980 where I'm in Christ. You see what I'm saying? The more you thirst after it, the more you're going to get. Right. And, and, and I don't see that. And what a blessed promise the Bible says. And one day they will be filled. You know when I think I'll get filled? It's when he says, Come up hither, or either that I die in the flesh, y'all throw me out in the boneyard, and then I'll be filled finally. I'll, I'll be full as I can get when I go home to be with the Lord. In the meantime, I want to be thirsty. I want more and more and more of it as the Lord would give it to me. That's the blessing that comes with thirst. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy. Now, I want you to look with me back in Genesis chapter uh, 19. Genesis 19. You probably see one of the best examples that you'll ever find in the Bible of this. Uh, Genesis 19. And this is probably the most difficult thing to do because you have And while he, meaning a lot, lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, before we look at it, and what a wonderful example it is, I want you to see that they had already been warned. This is Lot and his family. Remember the two angels came during the night, <laughs> and uh, remember Lot's example, you talk about a cold, uh, indifferent Christian, and I believe Lot was saved because the Bible said of, of the city of Sodom, he delivered just Lot. And, uh, and uh, meaning that he was just with God, not just only one, because he also delivered his two sinful daughters and his back-looking wife. But I want you to see that in that, that just lot, he was just before God. Now, they come in, and remember Lot's plan? I'm going to fix you up something to eat, and in the morning I want you out of here. Isn't that the attitude that we have toward God? Remember they came down and the Bible says Lot bowed before him and they weren't corrected for bowing. So I'm assuming this was Jesus and the Holy Ghost that came to see them and, and he bowed before him and he fixed him a meal and said, you go on. 
You know, you think about, uh, you know, uh, traditional uh, services. When you come in, you have Sunday school, you have church, and then everybody leaves and goes home, and you come back at night and you do it all over again. You know what? Uh, that's the attitude most. is a lot attitude. You've got this much time to get a hold of God. You've got this much time to bless me. And then you move right on. And that's what, that's all that Lot wanted. And you remember, they said, listen, destruction is finally coming. God is going to destroy this thing in the morning. It's going to be wiped out completely. This simple city full of sodomites is going to be wiped off the face of this earth with fire and brimstone coming down out of heaven. And you did not, you know what? It didn't prompt Lot to do nothing. Now, you know what? I don't mean preach. I don't mind preaching on hell because you listen to me tonight and you hear this hell's reality and it will be the home of the unsaved throughout the ceaseless ages. But I found from 20 plus years of ministry, giving them a warning like that does not help. No. It really doesn't. Uh, might make them scared for a little while. But it doesn't help. Now, if you know just what the loving God that he is, what does the Bible say that he did? Come on, Lot. Let's get out of here. You know, the, the brimstone's about to come. Let's go down. No, please, Lot. No. So he grabbed him by, and they literally pulled him out of town. See, that's salvation by grace. See, God came to get me. I didn't go to him. He drug me out of the pits of a sinful life. I didn't go to him. And you talk about a wonderful, wonderful picture of salvation. He drug them out, not the other way around. And then judgment fell. And you remember, you remember on this is what she had to look at back and get one more little glimpse of sin. And she was consumed in the moment she did it. Test sense of testimony even today. And so, what were those individuals? They were merciful. They drug them out and they didn't deserve it. They drug them out when they wanted to sit, when they wanted to sit there. That's mercy. That's grace. And so we say, for those that are that merciful to others, the Bible says those individuals shall obtain mercy. In other words, you don't go around and putting people down and saying, you ain't no good, you make me sick, your life's a disgust to me. You say, listen, Christ is coming. That book is real. Grace is the only means of salvation. And pray desperately, pray their heart would be broken. Because you know what? When you boil the water off, that's pretty much all we can do. Right. And so we find then that being merciful, uh, he, will, he will return that fourfold of mercy for our ungodly deeds and the things and the idle thoughts that come out of our mind. He will return that again. He'll give us mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now that's the soul. That's the inward man. It's not this pump that keeps my blood going tonight, but it's the soul. How do you get pure in heart? It's a work of grace. You know, this evening, if the Lord is showing your condition before God, even as vile as it may be, you're a very blessed person tonight. Because you know what? Most people never, ever see it. They see themselves as okay. They see themselves as pretty good. They'll see themselves as good as anybody else. But when you begin to get a glimpse that you deserve hell, whole, whole new set of ball games, is it not? And, and that's, that's what the Lord is saying here. These individuals, these people, <laughs> that are pure in heart, truly been saved, guaranteed, they shall, doesn't say may, they ought to, they shall see God. That means sitting in his very presence, the mighty Jehovah of all the earth, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireel, uh, the great I am, see him literally that day in glory. Those individuals that have this, we're going to see him. That's a guarantee. That's a promise. 
It's not a beatitude. That's a, it's a wonderful promise, wonderful truth from God that those individuals that are pure in heart, we're going to see, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, what is a peacemaker? Well, the best way to look at it is the opposite of troublemaker. You ever met a troublemaker? Sly, uh, get, the, get the pot stirred, and nobody ever knows that has spoon in it. You know what I'm saying? Those are, peop those are people that are not peacemakers. Now, if I went up to a Catholic and was trying to preach to them, teach to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I started in Revelation 17 and described the great poor of the Catholic Church, you think, I, you think I'm going to be any benefit to them? You think I'm going to be any help to them? Certainly not. That's not being a peacemaker. That's starting a fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to certainly understand and know that it ought to be uh, us that are that are that are earmarked as peacemakers. We don't go looking for trouble. We don't go uh, creating difficulty where there ought not to be any. We look for peace. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Now I have to say, very rarely, if ever, in my ministry, have I ever been persecuted. One time kind of stands up, but it wasn't. You know, I didn't get baby hit in the head and stuff. But I told my boss, I've got to preach this meeting. And she says, well, I'll have to let you go. And I said, adios. You see, really, I could have, I could have put that meeting off another week or two, and I would have been fine. But, but what would I have been giving into? What would the rest of the years of my ministry be in? You know what? I really believe this. They've been nothing more than a mockery to myself. Me telling you to be obedient and then me not being obedient, how could you follow me? And, and, and so we find in this that uh, we really have some persecution down through the years if you stick with it. Now listen, if you look like the world and act like the world and dress like the world, you know what? There's no persecution coming to you. But if you stand with that book, people are going to make fun of you. If you stand with that book, they'll say you're weird. Uh, if you stand with that book, they'll ask you why you do this and why do you do that. You know, have you ever wondered this? And Sister Brenda, uh, she'll say this. Fishing tournaments are always on Sunday. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday, right? You know what? If I like to fish, which I don't, and if I, would, and if I was good at it, which I'm not, I'd still have to let that stuff go. You see what I'm saying? And, 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 and so we find then as the Lord's people that many times the, and the world they get is always stacked against us. We're not going to win there. Blessed are ye, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes. Again, we already talked about how we obtained righteousness, and that was through obedience. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now we've had the kingdom that's here on earth. Now we have that one is going to be the kingdom in heaven. The, the glory of God. Uh, those that are saved and are called up to be with the Lord God. Those individuals that says here, if you are enduring persecution, if you're sticking to the stuff, you're in the kingdom of God. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you. Now, if you haven't seen that recently, you got your head in the sand, it's time to pull it out. Uh, church is being demanded to stop over a virus that's really not that serious. And being arrested when they don't. Being persecuted when they don't obey. You know what that is really, if you, if you really look at it, that's tyranny. The very thing this country stands against, they're doing it themselves to us. And so 
these individuals, th th this situation is not far away and in biblical times. Listen, it's right here in the good old USA in 2020. It's present even today. <laughs> they were, were reviled. We're hated. Uh, we're narrow-minded. We read a book that's over 400 years old in the English translation. You know, the more I see people going to the, a, the ESV and the New King James, you know what? I'm going to stick to this right here. And people will call me a dummy. People will say I lack education. And you know what? That's reviling me. That, that's making me a mockery. Blessed are ye when, when men shall revile you and persecute you, which they do, which shall persecute uh, you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Now I want you to see they're going to say evil, but to get the blessing it has to be falsely. <laughs> in other words, if you have evilness in your life and you and you have a constant double standard for here and at home, listen, <laughs> that that that's that's not false to tell you the truth. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So if, if it can't be considered a false statement, like if somebody said, Larry, you're a good-looking woman, that's a false, false statement, and I can prove it. But if they say something else, maybe they say, you know what? You're a little rough on your kids. You know what? Uh, you walk off from work early sometime, you know? I'd say, well, maybe I am. You see, it's got to be a false statement about you. It's got to be something, but it, it, it's got to be something that they can't peg you in. And then if you do that, if they're just making up a big bigotry story against you, if that is the case, rejoice. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Have you ever thought about what your reward will be and will it not be? Uh, I've given that a lot of thought down through the years. And I'm about to come to this. I don't have a whole lot to look forward to. If you look at it in the lines of the scriptures, when old Stephen, man, they had the rocks ready. And he said, I see the I see the son standing by the father. But before he all said, before he got to the point of passing from this place to the next, remember what he said? He says stuff like this, ye have killed the anointed. You've, you've mocked all the prophets. He was honest with those people. He was honest with the pious, self-righteous Jew. And they hated him for it. That's why they hated Christ too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we find, we find that the end of this, uh, the end of this will, will <laughs> lead <laughs> to a reward. Now, I don't understand everything about the rewards. I, I've studied a lot on the crowns. I about come up to the point I don't know that I have one of them. <laughs> but the, the Bible says there is a crown for ministry. But with that said, what would mine look like? You know what? I, I've seen some cheap paid preachers. What's the crown going to look like? You know what I'm saying? Has no dedication. Has no interest in souls. It, it, if y'all could not pay me one penny, I would still show up. Because listen, I'm not here for money. And if I was, that is my reward. A thousand bucks a month, right? <laughs> not much a reward in the all of eternity, is it? Not that I don't appreciate your service, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying what is your motivator? Why do you come here? Why, why, why do you, and I hate to use this term, why do you religiously come to this building week after week, month after month, year after year? Is it for you or is it for your service to God? See, in that day, our rewards will be right because the righteous judge will be the one that gives them. To look at it in the manner that exactly it is. So great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets 
which were before you. Now, um, if you don't understand about the persecution of the prophets, read the entire book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and you will find uh, you will find what persecution was about. And you know, uh, all they did was tell the truth, and they hated it. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, the only thing. <laughs> salvation is found is the sacrifice of God and the grace given by God. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus and the grace given by God, that is your only hope tonight. And that's not popular. You know, you know how religion developed? It's because that's not popular. We want something we can do, don't we? You know what the center of prayer developed? People wanted something that they could contribute. You know what baptismal regeneration, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. You know where that comes from? People want to do something. So people want to contribute to their own good. Uh, so I ask you tonight, how many of these, and I know we don't deserve one of them, but the rich truth here is that we're promised them, we are given them. If you have this characteristic, this will be your blessing. Now, some of them are very obviously stated. They're not going to be to the next world, but we will get them. And some of them, the best I can understand, some of them right now, like the comfort of the Lord God. That, that's right here, right now. Everybody's worth it, worth it. Uh, a fellow said the other day, he's almost young enough to be one of my children. He's 34. And uh, he says, nothing bugs you, does it? And I said, not really. He said, well, aren't you scared? I said, not really. You know, it's a perfect opportunity to witness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a perfect opportunity to say, this is why I have my peace. Because I'm dependent on the Lord God. I'm not dependent on someone to come up with a vaccine for this virus. I'm dependent on God. And that should be your attitude too.